Rub up your engines! Well, General Motors is trying to save money, so they've cut 500 salaried workers. I find this phenomenally interesting because this is about a month after their CEO Mary Barra said to the investors, oh no, we're not going to fire anybody. They said they weren't planning any layoffs. Well, as the saying goes, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. And now they're laying off 500 white collar workers. Now, of course, they can't lay off the people that are building them. They're having a hard enough time finding people to work in the factories to build the things, which is one of the reasons the quality is so bad. The quality control isn't too hot. And now they decide, now nah, we're going to get rid of some of these white collar workers. Well, if you know anything about corporations, my father-in-law worked for a big petrochemical company and he told me one time, he said, Scotty, I could fire 80% of the people in these offices and make the business run better. He said, the only problem is one of these is the boss's son who a boss is going to let me fire him, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're laying off 500 of their white collar workers. What did these people do? You know, sit around, do nothing all day long. I mean, kind of makes you wonder. They can lay off 500 people and they say they're going to build better cars. Hey, what were those people doing in the first place? Now, believe it or not, GM has a person. Maybe they should fire this person, but this person's title is, and I quote, GM Chief People Officer Arden Hoffman will find profit by reducing corporate expenses, overhead, and complexity in all our products. <laughs> Maybe they should get rid of their chief people officer too. That's kind of a useless position if you ask me. The very fact that they have a chief people officer kind of tells you, boy, they're bloated. That's one bloated corporation, right? I'd like to see all the titles of all the people work what they do. Yeah. <laughs> Under assistant, chief assistant, secretary of blah, blah. Yeah. This is like something out of a bad novel. You know, you think, oh boy, that guy had no imagination. He had to make this crap up. Well, this is real. They actually have such positions. Now, the letter that that person sent out said, and I quote, this will impact a small number of global executives and classified employees following our most recent performance calibration. Well, if 500 is a small number, boy, they got way too many people working. They're doing nothing. <laughs> Hey, and you wonder why they're getting so much money? The other day I saw the GMC Sierra was the most expensive actual cost at 60 something thousand dollars a piece. Not the list price. Will people actually pay for the vehicles? Well, they're paying for all these bloated corporations to give money to these people that they don't actually need. Well, Nissan's at it again. Almost a million rogues are going to be recalled because they have these stupid jackknife keys and the jackknife system might not work right and it might pop out of the <laughs> car and turn the car off while you're driving down the road. Yes, brilliant ideas by Nissan. Quality control, phenomenal, you know? Now, it covers certain rogues from 2014 to 2020. They sold a lot of these things, right? I warn people, don't buy them, but people do anyway, so they're not listening to me. <laughs> Maybe they should have, right? As well as some rogue sports models from 2017 to 2022. They say that can happen without warning a stupid jackknife key could just poop, come flying out of the ignition <laughs> and then turn your car off. And of course, if you get in a wreck, the airbags won't work if the car's turned off. It's one massive blunder after another for this company. Here's the problem. And I quote, they say, the jackknife key may not hold the key blade in the extended open position. Over time, the internal pivot of the jackknife key may weaken and a key fob could unlock and rotate down, turning the car off. And as of present time, Nissan didn't even have a solution for this problem. How about not making jackknife keys? How about just a plain old key made out of metal that's solid that's going to stick in there? This is why. Why reinvent the wheel? We had keys. They worked perfectly fine, right? Well, why reinvent the wheel? We're still using round wheels, right? They haven't invented a better one. Why not? That's with a key that works. You know? Now, in this case, this is one case that you would have been better off with a keyless ignition that has no key. Then it's just the interconnection of the electronics of the fob, and you push a button to start it, and there isn't a key that can fall out and turn the car off. So if you do have one of these things with a stupid jackknife key, my advice is put some duct tape or something on it to keep it in so it doesn't slop back in and knock itself off. <laughs> Duct tape can save many things. It just shows you the absurdity of both production and ideas at the Nissan company. What do you need a jackknife key for anyways? How about just a plain old straight key? Come on. You know, oh, it doesn't look as cool. It doesn't jackknife in, right? Well, it'd be really cool if it flies out and you get killed down the road because you got some stupid little jackknife key instead of just a plain old metal key that goes in a hole.
Tubo Solo says, I got transmission issues. I got 94 Chrysler LH, 3.5 liter. I drove to work. The vehicle revved up. The speed went down. I pulled over. I hit about 35, 40. The transmission downshift hard. Then when I got to 50, it revved and didn't shift. I don't have anything to connect to it because it's a 94 OBD1. Could you tell me how I can get data on this? Well, you're going to have to get an old scanner. The old scanners don't give much data. You're going to have to find a mechanic like me or buy an old scanner, and the old ones give some very basic data. You can also hook it up to read the check engine light flashes, but let me tell you something, you're wasting your time. I can tell you right now, your transmission scrapped out. Those had one of the worst transmissions in the world, and the only reason yours is a 94 and it finally broke now, even though it's 94 is because you only got 107,000 miles on it. It's the miles that were. So your transmission's crapped, and if I were you, I'd junk the car. It's not worth fixing. Those transmissions were horrible. They broke like that. You would need a complete rebuild. The vehicle is not worth it. It just isn't worth it. I mean, if you want, find a mechanic who's got an old scan tool and put it in, but I can guarantee he's just going to say your tranny shot. From that explanation, there's nothing that makes them go like that other than internal destruction of the automatic transmission. When you stop on it, just revs off. Up, and then the car actually slows down and then when you got to 50 it revved up and it wouldn't even shift and just slipped your transmission is shot I mean you could check the fluid it's an old one it's got a dipstick maybe it lost a lot of fluid put new fluid in if that's the case might fix it right but I doubt it because even if the fluid all leaked out and it went that bad and had hard shifts down it's probably damaged inside anyways because if you run the transmission low on fluid it will destroy itself and if it got to that point that it slipped it, it's going to be shot go ahead and try to find a mechanic that can analyze but I can just about guarantee he's going to say the tranny shot get rid of it. it's not worth fixing those trannies are only good for a little bit of mileage and yeah you got it 94 a lot of years but only 107,000 miles and that's generally when those things crap out they were just piles of junk back in those days I had a customer with one he said it was the worst car he ever had and he'll never buy about a Toyota after that never had any problems Debbie Jean says the battery starter and alternator all failed at the same time I got a Nissan Maxima 2116,000 miles what would cause a battery alternator and starter to fail at the same time if you had a massive electrical short like a power wire got loose and hit the body of the car that could short all those things out now it's kind of a rarity that all of them are going to go at the same time you might have a bad mechanic who's just selling you a whole bunch of crap because here's the thing you can't check the alternator or the starter if you have a bad battery if your battery is really bad you disconnect the cables from the battery have a mechanic like me then test the battery disconnected from the car if the battery's bad you got to replace the battery first because it's got to have a certain amount of voltage to correctly test the alternator and starter so now for you the first thing I do is have the battery tested and if it's bad replace that first then start doing testing because it's really rare for them all to go at the same time but like I say if you had a massive electrical short and a live wire touched the body of the car that's negative electricity and the cables are positive electricity that could short everything out right but I doubt if that's the case. Realize you cannot test the starters or the alternators correctly. If you have a bad battery, you'd have to replace the battery first, then retest. I've had many people say, oh man, I changed my alternator because the guy said the alternator was bad. Then I test the system. I say, well, you got a bad battery. So I'll put another battery and then it works fine. And they say, well, did I really need an alternator? I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> you'd have to get your old one back. I'd have to put it on the car with the new battery and retest it. I actually had a guy do that once. And when he bought the old alternator I put the old one back on with a new battery it showed it was still working so you can only test them when the battery's good realize that you need a certain amount of electricity if you don't have it forget testing all kinds of stuff because you'll get false data oh Poe says I have a faded black bumper I got an 05 Honda CRV the plastic bumpers are faded I know it's because the oil's cooked out of it can I wipe them down with mineral oil WD-40 uh, what can I do well you can do all kinds of things if you want you know mineral oil and stuff is not that bad of an idea if you want to keep doing it uh I find the best thing is there are various petroleum-based substances that will bring the black out. And there's a bunch of them out there. I like the black to black one. It's pretty good. And it's made for plastic bumpers and rubber bumpers to make them look black again and, and it's so handy because it's already in a little bottle you can leave it in the trunk every once in a while you can rub it polish it up that you know that's the best stuff that I've seen but I mean you can try all kinds I've seen people use mineral oil WD-40 doesn't last long it's not made really for that I wouldn't use WD-40 you know but the products that are made for the black plastic bumpers they seem to work the best like back to black that'll bring it back and you can polish them every once in a while and make them look pretty good so if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, 
Remember to ring that bell.